Christian for over 28 years talking about things that matter with people who care. Production of McQuistion is made possible in part by individual viewers, supporters of the Foundation for Responsible Television, the Hatton W. Sumner's Foundation, helping to educate the public about the fundamental principles of their democracy and thus be in a position to help formulate public policy. Moss Adams LLP, certified public accountants and consultants, providing industry smart tax, assurance and consulting solutions to help businesses and their owners succeed since 1913. The University of Texas at Dallas, creating the future. Some people make the case that it was the assassination of President John Kennedy in November 1963 that either led to or enhanced what they call the national security state. On this program, we'll define the national security state, we'll examine what our CIA and other agencies were doing 50 years ago, and whether their actions were legal. We'll also explore what President Kennedy thought about Cuba, the Soviet Union, and Vietnam, and whether his ideas for peace had anything to do with his assassination. So let's meet the experts in the studio. First, starting on my right is Dave Perry. He's been researching the Kennedy assassination since 1976. He's published various articles, provided research to Vincent Bugliosi, among others, and he is my and Hugh Ainsworth's favorite conspiracy debunker. So Dave, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Sitting next to you is Jacob Hornberger. He's the founder and president of the Future of Freedom Foundation in Alexandria, Virginia. He's a native Texan, however. He has a law degree from the University of Texas. He's an outspoken advocate for freedom and limited government, and he's the author of this book, which you'll see a picture of, called The Kennedy Autopsy. So, J Jacob, welcome from uh, the nation's capital. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Nice to be here, Dennis. Tell us what the national security state is and why you think it's a problem. Well, remember that the United States started out with as a constitutionally limited government republic. Uh, the big watershed took place after World War II, where the, the limited government republic was converted to what we call a national security state. It is a type of governmental structure that characterizes totalitarian regimes. China is a national security state. North Korea is a national security state. It's characterized by a giant military establishment, uh, a secretive intelligence force with the power to assassinate people, including assassinating people covertly and then a giant National Security Administration that has the power to spy on people, monitor their activities. Totally contrary to the principles of a free society. And the idea was that we need this totalitarian structure to fight communism, but in the process we abandon the principles of freedom and limited government on which America was founded. Okay, so we, we go back to that Second World War and after that obviously a lot of people, perhaps if we had been old enough ourselves, we might have been very concerned about the Soviet Union, which is the communist thing that you're talking about. There was an organization formed, I think, by Truman in 47. Tell us about that and then how it morphed into what we know today as the CIA. Yeah, it was very ironic. I mean, the United States partners with the Soviet Union in World War II against Nazi Germany. Almost immediately when the war is over, they convert the Soviet Union into a new official enemy, which had been Hitler's enemy. And they actually bring Nazis into the government. The CIA did. And then in 1947, the National Security Act is enacted that brings the CIA into existence, ostensibly as an intelligence gathering operation, but somebody slipped some nebulous language into the act, which the, U, uh, which the CIA used, to say, well, now we have the power to affect regime change operations around the world, coups, uh, assassinations, kidnappings, and, of course, it ultimately morphs into the NSA, the whole national security establishment, the Cold War mindset that doesn't go away when the Soviet Union dismantles and the Cold War is over. So it's, it's a straight line to back what happened in post-World War II and where we are today with this, these forever wars abroad, forever war on terrorism, and of course the loss of liberty uh, here at home. Yeah, I'm going to bring you into some of those regime changes in just a minute, but Dave, let me ask you this. You have I think Hugh Ainsworth and spoke to our Rotary Club yesterday, and he, he was the only person, I think, that was there in Dealey Plaza. He was there at the Texas Theater when Oswald was arrested, and he was in the uh, 
right where uh, Oswald was killed. Basement of the, the jail. In the basement of the, of the jail, yeah. <coughs> so he was there in all those places. And he, he said there's been 159 conspiracies about the JFK thing, and I told him you'd debunked 155 of them. Is that true? No, there's, a, there's probably only about 60, and I've done about 50. Oh, 50 of the 60, okay, <laughs> all right. So 60 legitimate sort of conspiracy theories. But uh, par part of the problem is that a lot of people who really had no interest locally suddenly became fa famous as a result of the assassination. I remember a reporter telling me one time that there were some people that happened to be in Dealey Plaza that their wives wouldn't bother to pick them up at the airport until after they appeared on camera. They ended up on the Geraldo show. And what happened is you had a group of people who ingratiated themselves into the assassination for better or worse. People claiming they were Lyndon Johnson's mistress or girlfriend or whatever it might be. But the problem is that when they write the books, they have to put dates in. And it's very easy to find on a particular date if one of the characters was someplace they weren't. And you're the person who would find those dates, right? Right. All right, so let me ask you this. If you had to characterize all the conspiracy theories you've heard, how many of them would involve one way or the other, the CIA, the FBI, the National Security Agency? The majority of them. Okay, all right. They and actually intertwine. And you have a situation, for example, where, this, uh, where the CIA, we now know, was using the mafia in a, an attempt to assassinate Castro. Right. So it gets pretty nebulous yeah. and so, also very complicated. Right. So would it be fair to say, just from your standpoint, that even though these conspiracy theories may not stack up in terms of there may be not have been anybody other than Oswald involved in the shooting, would it be fair to say that there were things done by the CIA and the FBI that in retrospect we found out that they lied to us and to the Warren Commission and other people. Would that be fair oh, to say? Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right, good. So I just want to make sure that you can't debunk that. Now, I'm no. going to go back to Jacob with the story. Now then, Jacob, I was uh, happy enough to attend your meeting on June 3rd of this year called the National Security State and JFK, which you had held in, in uh, the Dulles Airport Marriott, as I recall, right there in the middle of the defense establishment. I don't know if anybody was taping that thing other than you <coughs> or not, but what is it that you had, I think you had 11 outstanding speakers, starting with Jeffrey Sachs, he had Ron Paul in the middle, who got the most, probably the most applause, but had less substance of the subject anyway, and then Oliver Stone. So from Jeffrey Sachs through you and to Oliver Stone, what were you trying to do, and what point were you trying to make, and what were these people saying? Okay, well, first of all, the, the, all the lectures were videotaped by C-SPAN, covered all of them, and they're now on C-SPAN's archive, as well as our website at the Future Freedom Foundation. But yeah, we had speakers like Oliver Stone, Stephen Kinzer from uh, Boston College, uh, Boston Globe columnist, several others, some of whom talked about the assassination, but others who took no position on the conspiracy angle or whether the, this was a regime change operation. But what the purpose of the conference was, was to establish the Cold War environment under which the assassination took place. A lot of Americans do not realize the significance of John F. Kennedy and his war against this national security state. He comes into office as a standard cold warrior, pretty much. He, he sided with anti-imperialist uh, movements in, in Africa and third world countries, which was different from what Alan Dulles and the CIA and so forth favored. But he comes into office pretty much a standard cold warrior. He agrees to the Bay of Pigs invasion, but that was the start of his evolution. He realized the CIA had double-crossed him uh, with the, the question of the air support. After that, he vows to tear, reputedly, vows to tear the CIA into a thousand pieces. He's furious. He fires Dulles, the revered director of the CIA. Things progress on. He starts losing faith in the military. They present him Operation Northwoods, which is a false flag opportunity uh, 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 plan to invade Cuba with false, false agents of the communists. All right, so let me stop you right there for a second. For that person watching who probably wasn't alive at this time, Kennedy gets uh, inaugurated in January of 1961. The Bay of Pigs happens what month? 61. 61. Just a few months later. Yeah, just two or three months. Already in plans under Eisenhower when Kennedy comes in, right? That's right. Okay, and the Bay of Pigs fails because they felt 
that Kennedy would support him with air once they showed it wasn't going to happen. And